first of all, um, why don't you give us a brief introduction to the whole book? Uh, if a philosopher looks at human beings, and then I have prepared, prepared some questions based okay. on how much time you've got. We can delve deeper in those, into those topics. Okay, okay. So I should explain that this book is part of a series that Cambridge University Press are putting out. A philosopher looks at dot, 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 dot. So it could be, for, I mean, another one is a philosopher looks at architecture. Another one is philosopher looks at games. Another one could be a philosopher looks at Muslims. A philosopher looks at young men with very long names that normal people can't pronounce. Okay, so I, I, I wanted to do one on a philosopher looks at um, Victoria because I thought it would be interesting to write about you know the empire and those sorts of things. But my editor didn't want that, so I, I then made some very very rude suggestions about a philosopher looks at. And I won't tell you what a philosopher looks at, but I was prepared to do some research if need be. Uh, I may be 80, but I'm not that old. <laughs> so we, we agreed that I would do a philosopher looks at human beings. Now, that's a pretty broad, a, you know, a pretty broad, um, what should we say, topic. So the question is, what am I going to do? And so I start off by saying, well, if I were a physiologist looking at human beings, I'd be interested in, um, you know, how the heart works and how the blood circulates and uh, how we respond to diseases and those sorts of things. I think that would be the sort of questions a physiologist would. And if I were a sociologist, then I'd be looking at things like, who is more likely to believe in God? Is it going to be you know, recent immigrants from Italy and Ireland, or is it going to be, um, you know, native-born Protestants or what? I mean, in other words, a, a sociologist is interested in group behavior. I mean, I was just reading an article by a sociologist who was talking about the decline of religious belief in America. And that, I mean, whether he's right or whether he's wrong, that's the sort of question a sociologist asks. So now my first question is, what kind of question does a philosopher ask? And why would philosophers have any right to answer that? In other words, what would make a philosopher the right person to try to answer such a question? And the question I came up with, and I'm not pretending that everybody would have chosen the same question that I chose, but my question is, why do we human beings think we're superior to all other animals' organisms. And of course, you know, this is, uh, this is right in the, the Hebrew Bible. What is man that thou art mindful of him, that has, thou hast made him, you know, little lower than the angels with dominion over all the animals? In other words, it, it's right there in the Christian tradition. It's obviously there in the Jewish tradition. And I presume equally, it's there in the is Islamic tradition as well. So this was my question is why is it then that we human beings think we're so bloody superior to all other animals and, uh, and plants, of course. And I said, it's not because we like each other more. In fact, in many respects, I like, I went to Zimbabwe once and I saw uh, warthogs. I don't know whether you've ever seen a warthog, but uh, uh, I think I can show you a picture of one. Hold on. Those are warthogs. Can you see my picture? Uh, no, it's not shared. Oh, I'm so sorry about that because mm -hmm. it's a really good picture. Okay, well, I'll send it to you after the podcast is over. Okay? Yeah, sure. It's, re it's really nice. But I, what I was saying was, why is it that in so many respects, I prefer warthogs to human beings? But I don't think that warthogs are superior to human beings. I mean, I think that, you know, we humans are the superior ones. So this was my question as a philosopher. Why do I think they're superior? What can I, as a philosopher, say in answer to that question? Now, what I start off by doing is saying, what I find remarkable is that people from all different spectrums or parts of the spectrum agree. I mean, obviously, 
Christians think that humans are superior. But interestingly, not uh, those outside the uh, Abrahamic tradition. I mean, for instance, if you look at Buddhists, although Buddhists have a hierarchy, in fact, you find that humans are pretty important in that hierarchy. So, you know, religious people think that humans are superior. But what about scientists? And the interesting thing I find is that somebody like Richard Dawkins or Edward O. Wilson are absolutely convinced that humans are number one. There's no question. They really, truly believe that we are the top of the evolutionary scale. But what I find very interesting is that people who criticize Dawkins and Wilson, not from a religious perspective, but from a supposedly scientific perspective, saying they Darwinism is true. People like uh, Thomas Nagel, for instance, nevertheless stress that they think humans are superior. Now, what I wanted to say was, I'm not comfortable with either of those positions. The first is it's a religious position because God made us superior. The second is a, let us say, a scientific position. I, I go out, I look at nature, and nature tells me that humans are superior. That's not my decision. Nature tells me that. And I'm not comfortable with either of those. So I said, what's the third option? Well, the third option is that it comes from within. It's us who makes the decision. It's not out there. It's not given to us by God, but it's us. Now, obviously, I do think that we're superior. I mean, I might I might like warthogs more than I like you, but I'm, I'm talking to you, not to a warthog at the moment. And so I call, I mean, this is the position of existentialists. Somebody like Jean-Paul Sartre says that we, it's our decision. It, what Sartre calls it, he says, we are condemned to freedom. We have to make the decisions. No one else can make the decisions for us. And so, in other words, if we think that humans are superior, that's because of our judgment, not because God tells us and not because the world tells us. It's because we make that decision within ourselves. So this is my problem then. And what I try to do in the book is look at this. And I say, well, how am I going to look at this? And I say, basically, we just simply have to look at the world. We have to see what does the world tell us, because certainly religious people take take science seriously. Obviously, scientists do and existentialists do. So I say, then what what are the scientific tools then that we could have to answer a question like this? Now, I'm a historian of science as well as a philosopher of science. So it's very natural for me to go to the history of science to look for answers about today, because I'm an evolutionist, and I believe that if you want to know what's going on today, you have to know what's going on in the past. I mean, for instance, if I want to know, for instance, why you are so unbelievably sexually attractive because you've got a beard, but your girlfriend doesn't have, why is this? I'm not going to find it looking at it today. I have to dig back into the past and say, you know, proto-mo, whatever they are, had more babies than those who didn't have sort of thing. So in other words, I have to look back at a, into history and see what it tells me. So this, was my, this is my approach then. What kind of approaches does science give us to answer questions like this? Now, I think either way, it's going to be evolution. So I'm not into, you know, seven days of creation or six days of creation, uh, not a religious answer. But I think that there are two, as it were, approaches or what I call paradigms after mm -hmm. Kuhn or uh, Excuse me. Excuse me. For a couple of seconds, uh, you, uh, the connection was breaking up. I couldn't hear the last 10 seconds or so. What, what connection are you worrying about? Uh, the connection was uh, was breaking up, and I couldn't get the last ten seconds or so. 
Oh, uh, we got to the point that if we want to uh, know the present, we need to go to the past and study the right. past. And what I'm saying then is if you go to the past, you find that there are two approaches, okay? Two approaches. One, which I call organicism, looking at things in an organic way. And this is the way of Plato. Plato says the world is an organism in the Timaeus, and it's obviously the world of Aristotle. Aristotle wants us to look at final causes as well as efficient causes. So that's the one approach. The other approach is the one that came in after the scientific revolution, which said, no, the world is not an organism. The world is a machine. The world is like a clock. And so you've got these two approaches. Now, what I want to say is that Darwinian evolutionary theory falls very strongly and completely under the mechanistic paradigm or meta mechanistic metaphor that Darwinians want to explain the world as though it were clocks. In other words, if I want to explain you, I want to find out how the various parts go together and click, 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 just like my watch. Where are we? Just like my watch. I want to see why you're like my watch. My watch keeps going round and round and round and round. Why do you... Why do you keep going round and round and round and round? I mean, you get up in the morning, you have your breakfast, then you go and, you know, you go to the bathroom and make poo, and then you get back, you work, and you have more, and you go through the day and whatever you do in the evening, and then you go to bed, and then you do it all over again. That's what my watch does. It goes to 12.12, and then it goes 12, da, 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 12, 30, 1 o'clock, and it keeps going round and round and round until, goodness me, it's 12 o'clock again. So, in other words, what I'm saying is I think the Darwinian looks upon us as though we were clocks. So, on the other hand, the organic position looks at us as though we were vegetable. It sees us developing and growing and, and this sort of thing. Now, the interesting thing I want to say about the organic position is that at some level it has progress to humans built in. Because if you think about the organic position, you start off with, let us say, an acorn. Okay? And the acorn, over the years, grows into a great big oak. In other words, it goes from the beginning to the end. And so I think the organic position tends very much to see we start with the blob and it, you know, through evolution, it gets more and more sophisticated until da dum da dum, we get Muhammad, ba 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 ba. Okay? And you're the peak, you're the absolute epitome. You, you could not get any higher than you. I mean, you are the end point of evolution. And this is the idea, I think, in the organic position. And what I want to argue is that if you look at people like, well, certainly people like Edward O. Wilson, the, you know, the well-known sociobiologist, it's clear that that's very much the tradition he stands in. Although he claims to be a Darwinian, I think he's much more of an organicist. And of course, the famous organicist in the 19th century was Darwin's contemporary, Herbert Spencer. And I think that Wilson is much more in the tradition of Herbert Spencer than he is in the tradition of um, Charles Darwin. And I'll never forget the first time I met Wilson in his laboratory at Harvard. I noticed on the wall that he had a great big picture of Herbert Spencer, which was much bigger than the picture of Charles Darwin. And I said, Professor Wilson, Professor Wilson, what are you doing with Spencer bigger than Darwin? And Wilson looked at me and smiled and said, Mike, great man, great man. So in other words, in respects, Wilson is a Spencerian rather than a Darwinian. I should say neither of the pictures were anything like as big as the picture he had on the wall of him getting a medal from <laughs> Wilson from then Professor Jimmy Carter. So he, he got his priorities right. Wilson, Spencer, 
Darwin. <laughs> okay. Whereas, as I say, I don't think the Darwinian thinks there is ultimately any better or any worse. I mean, obviously, you're a very sophisticated organism and you work well. But let's, now we put you out, let's say, on the plains. I don't know whether you have plains where you are, but certainly in Russia, Canada, where I used to live, there's, you know, miles and miles and miles and miles of nothing but grass. Now, we've got two animals, you and a sheep. Okay, you and a sheep. And we've got miles and miles and miles of grass. We don't have any other food. There's no chickens, there's no eggs, there's no bacon, there's no nothing, just miles and miles and miles of prairie. Who's going to do better on the prairie, you or the sheep? Well, obviously the sheep are because, you know, they're designed to, to live off, you know, they're designed to live off hay or grass. And the fact that you are very, very clever and they're not, it's so big deal. It doesn't matter. I mean, there's no, there's no point in being very, very clever if there's no way to use it. I mean, if you, you know, if you can't use it. And the other thing is, of course, brains, having a brain requires a lot of protein. I mean, that's why, you know, that's why we're meat eaters and not vegans is because brains require a lot of protein. And what's the best way of getting protein from the bodies of other animals? I mean, it's as simple as that. So I think Darwinism says, no, I don't see any reason to think that humans are superior. I think that I personally, I'm a Darwinian, I think that humans are superior, but that's my judgment, not something that science tells me. Whereas somebody like E.O. Wilson thinks that humans are superior, and it's not his judgment, it's because that's the way the world tells him it is. In other words, Wilson thinks there's a progress up to humans. And so it's not our decision whether humans are superior. It's nature's decision. Just, uh, just as the religious person says, it's not who us who decided. It was God. God made, us on this, God made us on the sixth day in his own image. I mean, you know, we did, I mean, I'm saying we didn't ask for that. God decided that that's what he would do. And here we are. And so now we are superior. And that means we've got obligations and those sorts of things. But it was God's decision. We are superior, but it wasn't our choice. Wilson says we are superior. It's not our choice, but it wasn't God who did it. It was nature. nature. And I say the Darwinian or what I call it like myself, a Darwinian existentialist has to make these decisions for themselves. Now, and I'll, I'll finish here because, I, you know, I'm sure you want to get into discussion. My book leads in the final two chapters to ethics, to moral questions. And so basically, I mean, I'm a philosopher. And so these are the things that as a philosopher I'm interested in. And of course, this is why I think it was appropriate for me to ask these questions and why it's appropriate for me as a philosopher to try to answer them. Because what do philosophers do? We look at morality and we ask about the nature of morality and we ask about the justification of morality. I, you know, you go home and, you know, let's put it this way. You're sitting down with your little sister and there's a piece of cake. And you're hungry and she's hungry. So you grab all the cake and eat it and say, sorry, little sister. I've eaten it. I was hungry. Now, you did that. But of course, a philosopher is going to say, yes, but you were not right in doing it. You were wrong when you did that. You at least should have shared the cake. It wasn't, it wasn't your decision that it was OK to eat the cake. No, it's, it's morality's decision. And if you behave that way, you're doing wrong. I mean, and so philosophers are interested in this. But of course, philosophers are also interested in what we call the meta-ethical side. That means the justification. Why is it wrong not to share that cake with your sister? Now, of course, the religious person says, because God says so. Now, the question is, 
what does the non-religious person say? And I think there's, there's two positions, and one is the organicist position, and one is the mechanist position, or the Darwinian position. The organicist position says it's, life is a progress up to humans. That's a good thing because we are the top. So what should we do? We should do everything to preserve the well-being of humans. And so that is our moral imperative. So, for instance, take global warming, global warming. It's clear that with glo if global warming keeps going, this is going to be very, very bad for the human race. I mean, I don't know. Let's say we're 100 billion today. If global warming keeps going in two centuries, I'd be surprised if we're 5 billion, probably less than that. Because apart from anything else, you know, with global warming, there won't be as much land and there'll be too much. So you won't be, be able to grow so much. And all of these things. And so it will be more and more difficult to live. And so basically, it'll be more and more difficult to be a human and to be reproduced and to have more offspring. So in other words, global warming is bad for the human species. The human species is a good thing. So global warming is a bad thing. And so I think the organicist position it's not a religious position. The religious position says <coughs> global warming <coughs> is bad because you're destroying God's creation or something like that. Or you're know, certainly harming humans and that's a bad thing. But I, God, decided that humans are the best thing. And so global warming is, <coughs> is wrong because you are going against what I... Let me get a, I've got a glass of water here, just a sec. Yeah. Global warming is bad because it's destroying humans. And I made humans in the image of God. And so, yeah. Now, Wilson says, no, it's not because of God. It's because nature made us superior. OK, so global warming is bad. Now, the question is, what does it let me hold on? What does a Darwinian like me, who thinks it all comes from in here, think? Well, I don't think anything outside is going to tell me that global warming is bad. So the decision is mine. Now, it doesn't mean to say I don't think that global warming is bad. Of course I think it's bad. But that's my decision. Because I make these judgments. There's no foundation beyond what I say. Suppose all humans were wiped out tomorrow and the only animals that were, or let's say, all animals were wiped out. So you've just got plants. Would, would, would global warming be a bad thing? No, because plants need carbon dioxide and of course global warming provides that. So from the point of view of plants, Global warming might be a very, very good thing, but it's all comparative to the organism. In other words, if, if plants could make the decision, they'd say, oh, yeah, let's have global warming. <laughs> but we can make decision and we say, oh, no. But the point is, what I'm saying is one isn't right and the other wrong. It's all a question of perspective. Whereas somebody like Ed Wilson would say, even if all humans were wiped out, Global warming would still be bad. And of course, God would say, yeah, if, even if all humans are wiped out, global warming is still not a very good thing. So basically, what I'm doing in the final chapter is I'm trying to say, yes, you can have morality. Of course, you can have morality. So I'm not saying do whatever you want. I'm not saying, you know, behave like those Russian soldiers at the end of the war when they moved into Germany, into East Prussia and they raped all the women. That's what they did in, at the end of the first, Second World War. I, I, they wanted to do it. They were ha able to do it. But I'm perfectly prepared to say it was wrong for them to do it, not because it's absolutely wrong or because God said it's wrong. It's because I make the decision that behaving towards my fellow human. And why would I make that decision? Well, one of the most obvious things is 
if my fellow humans are unhappy, it's very likely that I'm going to be unhappy too. I mean, let, I mean, obviously we know this, that if people in Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia or wherever it's Iraq are unhappy, it, first of all, it's not good for the world as a whole. But secondly, it's not good for me to know that so many of my fellow human beings, I mean, let's take America. At the moment, because of the pandemic, 20% of us are living very comfortable lives. And that, that I'm living a very comfortable life. But 40% of us are really don't have enough food, can't pay their rent, are in real trouble. Now, I could say, well, I'm OK, Jack. I don't care. But of course, I do care because I'm part of the community. So, yes, I make the decision that not caring about my fellow humans is not a good thing. Why? Because it affects me. And so if I don't care for my fellow humans, then I'm not happy. I mean, look, I'm talking to you now on a podcast, OK? This is what, our, the fourth one we've done? I mean, and we spend an hour each time. Now, why don't I say, ah, oh, I don't need to do this? I mean, you know, who is he? He's got a very peculiar name. I know that. But I mean, who? I mean, why should I bother, you know, particularly to talk to somebody with a scraggy beard and a very peculiar name? I mean, no, no, I've got other things to do with my time. I, you know, I would just soon put my feet up and I'm afraid this is just water, but have a beer. <laughs> now, are you a Muslim? Are you allowed to drink? Uh, I'm an atheist. You people have always got excuses, haven't you, for not doing the right thing. There you are. Your parents say, oh, please, Mahabi, blah, 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 don't drink. And you turn to them and say, mum and dad, I'm sorry. You raised me properly, but I'm an atheist. I'm going to have a drink. That's the <laughs> trouble with children. I've, I've had five. I know what you're like. Appalling. But anyhow. <laughs> but the point is I'm making is... Why do I do this? Well, because I feel I've got the ability to do this. I've got the training to do this. I've, I've spent my life. I've had very good people have paid me money to, you know, my job, all these things. I feel it's my job to, to share it with others. I don't mean that I'm going, to, I'm going to spend every day and every night doing podcasts, because I'm not. But I, I would feel very badly if I said, oh, no, you know, I mean, there may be reasons why I can't, you know, I'm not feeling very well. Or as I get older, I can do less of them. Those sort that's that's different. But if I simply said, nah, I don't think I'll bother, you know, I would rather watch television instead. Yeah. Well, I don't think I would be getting the full satisfaction out of my life. John Stuart Mill, I, I'm sure you've seen the letters I send to you. John Stuart Mill says, if you, can meet, if you meet somebody who is in reasonably good circumstances, who is not happy, then I can tell you that that is a person who thinks only about themselves. That's the nature of human beings. We're social animals. And unless we are part of the group and sharing and contributing and expecting to get it back again, of course, I don't think we're truly happy. So... I'm not finding it out there. I'm not getting it from God. I'm getting it from my human nature. The way to behave is obviously the way, I mean, if you like, it's selfish. How can I make myself happy? And the way I can make myself happy is by not thinking about myself. It's because I'm a social animal. I'm much happier if, you know, like you, I, I see my little sister and I say, come on. Not only do I want you to have your half of the cake, but I know that you really like chocolate cake. And, you know, I like chocolate cake, but you have the big, the big portion. I'll have a small one and you have the big one. I mean, and you know that what's going to happen is you're going to go away and feel much happier that you've done that. But, of course, what you expect is when your sister is no longer a little sister, but a big sister, and now she's got a little brother. She says to her little brother, Mohammed, ba 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 ba, here's the cake. 
you have the bigger half and I'll take the smaller one. And why is that? Because your sister has been trained to think, you know, she's been part of the social thing by you. And she sees that you are such a nicer person, happier person, because you share it. Suppose she's got two brothers. There's you, Mohammed, blah, 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 blah. And there's, let's, what should we call him? Mike, Mike, okay? Mm -hmm. So there's Mohammed, blah, 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 blah. And there's Mike. And we've got the little sister here, okay? Okay, what should we call her? Fatima, Fatima, okay? <laughs> okay, so we come in and there, there's the cake here. And Mohammed, blah, 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 says to Fatima, no, I want you to have more than I have. But Mike says, no, I'm bigger than you. I'm going to take as much as I can. Well, the point is, first of all, you ask yourself, who is probably going to be the happier brother? Who is going to be the brother who's happiest or happier? I can tell you right now, it's Mohammed blah, 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 rather than Mike, because Mike's just selfish. All he wants to do is think about himself. Yeah. But of course, as your little sister grows up, she's going to say, well, you know, Mike's my brother, but I don't much like him. Whereas Mohammed blah, 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 I really like him. And so I can't give him much, but Mohammed, let's go out this afternoon and let's go to the park and, you know, and maybe we could feed the ducks or something like that and have an afternoon. Mike, no, no. Well, anyhow, Mike, you don't want to do this anyway. You want to go off and do something. Now, I'm saying your little sister's going to grow up and she's going to realize more and more and more that the way to get the happiness is to spend the afternoon in the park with you rather than just watch your brother, the other brother watching television and saying, now, don't bother me, don't bother me, go and find something to do. I'm watching television. And you're going to say, first of all, which of the two of you are happier? But of course, the other thing is, how is your sister going to behave? She's going to be responding to you rather than to Mike. And we hope that she's going to grow up. And so when she's got children of her own or little brothers and sisters of her own, she'll say, come on, let's go to the park. Not, oh, I'm, you know, I'm just busy. I'm going out with my friends or whatever it is. So what I'm saying then is I think as a Darwinian, you can have a moral system, but it's not one that's given to you. It's one which comes from part of your human nature. It isn't arbitrary. It isn't just, oh, well, what I, it isn't just, if it feels good, then do it. It isn't just saying, if you want to do that, do it. Because it's certainly not that. It, and that's not what it is. It, there, there are, it tells you sometimes there are things you want to do, but which you should not do. You should not do. You, should, you know, away with it, but you say, no, my conscience tells me I should not do this. But the point is, what I'm saying is, ultimately, you're going to be happier. You're going to feel better if you pass that exam because you worked hard at that exam and passed it rather than you went on the, you know, you went on the computer and found some place which would give you the exam answers. Oh, yeah, it's easier to do that, but you won't get the satisfaction of doing it yourself. And so what I'm saying is, at the end of my book, is this is what human beings are superior only because we judge them to be. But that doesn't mean to say anything goes. We can certainly, we can certainly have morality and we can have morality that works. And so, base, and that's why I think I, as a philosopher, have the right, and it's right for me to try to answer those questions. And that's what the book's all about. And at now, the end what I want you to do is go out and buy a copy, and buy a copy for your mum and dad, and buy a copy for your little sister, and maybe for that mean brother you've got, buy Mike a copy. So, you know, get 10 copies, and, pass them and when you've given those out, Buy another 10. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And you'll but, feel better and I'll feel better. Yeah, because you will have more money, you'll have better sales. And also, I think, but for that, we have to wait until Easter, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh -huh. And at the, at, uh, in the epilogue, you mentioned that you are a um, Darwinian existentialist. And this is actually what you explained is what it means, that the value and the judgment does doesn't come from a God or the nature or out there, 
but you are to call what is moral, what is the value. Yes, I, I, I want to be a little bit more sophisticated than that because I'm part of evolution. And so I didn't wake up and then, you know, when I was 10 or something, say, oh, I ought to start liking people. No, my parents told me that and my teachers told me that. Why? Because we have evolved as a group. So we as a group have made these decisions. Now, it doesn't mean to say that when my teachers or my parents tell me these things, it's wrong. I mean, what you're going to do is you're going to say, often we all do this. We should do as we grow up. Why should I do what my parents tell me? Why should I do what my teachers tell me? And sometimes you decide that you shouldn't. I mean, suppose you grow up at the time of Hitler. And Hitler, your teachers, because of Hitler, say, kill Jews, hate Jews. Now, I would like to think you've got the freedom to say, no, I'm not going to accept that. So I'm not saying you always will or even always must accept what you're taught. But generally, we're working as a group. And the group in the past, it's worked and it's evolved. And so we're part of the group. So I do want to say, Sartre says, you know, we're condemned to freedom. Each and every one of us has to make our own decision. Well, yes, we do. But it doesn't mean to say we're doing it in a vacuum. We're doing it because we're part of a social group. And so, you, you know, the things that you're doing are things that your mother and your father taught you and your teachers and you, your schoolmates and all of these people. So it's part of a thing. Now, as I say, it may well be at times you want to say, no, I feel I've got to go against what you're saying. I feel that it's important. I, I could not live with myself if I just did what all of you people are doing. I've got to make my own decision. That's fine. I mean, and that's, of course, what being an existentialist is. Ultimately, it's your decision. It's your decision. And ultimately, as you grow up, you've got, you know that. If, I mean, if you've had a proper training, neither your teachers nor your parents want to say to you, Mohammed, always do what I say. Always do, because I said it. No. What you want them to do is say, I'm telling you what to do. But then when you say, well, why should I do it? You don't want your parents or your teacher to say, because I said so. No. What you want them to do is sit down with you and talk as I've been talking today. I want your, pe I want your parents or your teachers to say, OK, Mohammed, what? If, you know, let's think, suppose you didn't do this, then what would be the effect? Well, I get all of this. Yes, but it would mean your classmates wouldn't. And they're going to be unhappy. Now, is that OK with you? Oh, yes, it's going to be fine. And then your teacher's going to say, all right, remember last week, Johnny, he got it and he took it all. And you remember how upset and you all the, all the others were? And you thought it was wrong. Now, if you behave that way, they're going to feel wrong. Now, are you happy with that? And of course, what you want is, you know, as the teachers talk to you, you're going to say, ah, I hadn't thought about that. Yes, I see. Yes. If I'm mean, then they're going to be mean back. Why? If I'm mean, then they're going to be mean. And so if I'm prepared to give them something now because they need it, maybe next week, what should we say? I forget to bring my lunch. And my schoolmates will say, come on, Michael, here's the sandwich. Have, you know, my mother always makes wait. Take one of mine. And you know, you'll be very grateful. But also, let's say Jack or whoever it is who's giving, will feel good too. Maybe even go home to his mum and say, mum, you keep making me so much food. But I'd like you to know today that was a very good thing because Michael forgot to bring his lunch. And I was able to give him a sandwich from what we made. And of course, that was so nice, particularly because Michael doesn't come from a rich family like we do. And sometimes I think Michael doesn't have enough food, even if he remembers it. And so I feel good. And, and his mum's going to say, you know, I'm glad you feel that way. That's how I'm so proud of you. I'm proud of you as my son, because I've brought a boy up who's prepared to give to others. You see, let me tell you about my children. 
I've got a daughter who's a lawyer. Now, as she was growing up, she was the most selfish human being you could possibly imagine. Staying out late, uh, unsuitable boyfriends, uh, lying, I mean, terrible. But now she's in her early 30s and she's a lawyer, but not a regular lawyer. She's what they call a public defender. She works for the government defending as a lawyer for people who don't have money to buy a lawyer for themselves. So she spends all day and every day working with people who are in trouble. Yes, that doesn't mean they haven't done wrong, but have no way of paying for a lawyer themselves. And so she is provided. Now, I, uh, first of all, I'm tremendously proud of my daughter, but I happen to know that she gets tremendous satisfaction from her job. Yes, some days she comes home and she's so tired and she says, oh my God, I just can't believe what a day I've had. But I know overall she's going to look, she says, yes, but you know, it was, it's, it's such an exciting job. It, it's interesting and it's so worthwhile. And sometimes I'm able to help somebody who really, that's what they needed was help. And I've been able to give it and I feel good about it. So this is what I'm saying is the kind of philosophy I'm trying to push in this book. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, I think in the first or second chapter, uh, you also mentioned that uh, Darwinian evolution completed the scientific revolution. Uh, I didn't actually quite get that. OK, Darwinian evolution, what? is the uh, complete, completes uh, the scientific revolution. Oh, I see what you mean, yes. Well, of course, it, I mean, it's developed over the years. I mean, Darwin didn't know anything about genetics. He didn't know about molecules. He didn't know about the double helix, all of these sorts of things. So, of course, we now know an awful lot that Darwin didn't know. We know a lot more about psychology, for instance. We know, for instance, I mean, Darwin in The Descent of Man, is very much men in control, women not. But of course, now we know that a lot of this is not true, that we know that if girls and women don't have to spend all day and every day doing housework and can control their contraception so they don't have as many children, so that they can go and get educated, we know that girls do just as well, if not better than boys. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a professor. <clears throat> Fifty years ago when I started, there were two men for every one girl in the class. Now it's two girls for every one man. I mean, the point is, what I'm saying is, so yes, there are changes. There are. And I would say now evolutionists, Darwinians, are quite happy now to say, yes, there's good reasons why women do as well. Well, Previously, Darwin would have said that there's good women reasons why men do better. So, of course, there's been changes. But what I want to say is we know the essential outlines, well, more than the outlines, of what makes evolution work, and that's natural selection. Those who are more, more successful pass on their characteristics, and those who aren't, don't. So those of your would-be ancestors who were intelligent and good-looking and friendly and all of these things, had lots of babies. And those of your would-be ancestors who were mean and stupid and hateful, by and large, people said, the girls said, I don't want to, I don't want to spend my life with you and have babies with you because, you know, you're mean and nasty and stupid. I'd much rather have, you know, I bet I'd much rather have my babies with Mohammed, blah, 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 because he's so intelligent and he's so thoughtful and he's so nice. And of course, he's the one who, you know, will help with the children. He won't come home and simply open a beer or whatever it is that you're allowed to open and say, OK, I've had a busy day. You get on with it. and Bring me my supper. No, he's going to come home and say, dear, I know you've had a busy day. Why can't I? Why don't? What the hell is going on here? I've got this. Uh, I've got. Uh, why don't you? Um, why don't I take the children to the park and give you a break? And you know the girls are going to say that's the kind of guy I want to live with. That's the kind of guy I want to be the father of my children, not Mike, who's just a selfish, you know, whatever. So, so yes, I'm. I, I, yeah, you're quite right. I mean, I'm a philosopher, but I'm also 
in the, from the scientific point of view, I'm a complete and committed Darwinian, yes. Uh -huh. And how does uh, Darwinian uh, evolution complete scientific revolution? Well, it is oh, the scientific revolution. Ah, oh, yes, well, that's a good question. You see, <clears throat> the trouble, the scientific revolution said it's all clocks going, you know, like this. But then the problem is, how do you explain organisms? Because organisms at some level, you see, although clocks have a purpose, from the point of view of the scientific revolution, all we want is things just tick tock, keep going round and round and round. It doesn't matter that it's telling the time. What matters is that on a regular basis, it keeps going round and round and round and round. Now, but organisms seem to be more, you, I hate to say this, seem to be more than get up, have breakfast, go to the bathroom, make poo, come back, have lunch, lie down, have a little sleep, get up, have supper, go out, come home, have sex with your wife or somebody else's wife and go to bed. And then the next day, start all over again, breakfast, poo. No, you say, no, you know, I've got purpose. There's things I'm doing for a purpose. I want to do these things that, you know, I've got goals. I've got aims. I spend this time working without getting a lot of money because I'm getting an education. I'm getting a doctoral degree and then I'll be able to get a much better job or something like this. And what I want to say is that this was a problem until Darwin came along. And with natural selection, Darwin was able to show how these aims and all of these things are just part of the clock business, but they come about because of this. So in other words, you don't need to bring God in or something like that, vital forces in to explain what's going on. You can do it all in terms of clocks like that. So that's what I want. You see, I don't think that Darwin disproves God. I mean, a lot of the atheists, somebody like Richard Dawkins wants to say, Darwin shows that there's no God. I don't think that's true at all. I mean, I, I mean, I don't see why you shouldn't turn around and say, well, yeah, I believe in God, but yeah, I, it makes good sense to me to think that God, God did it all through evolution rather than, you know, fairy tales that he did it all in six days and then came along and zoom, zoom, zoom like that. No. A God who can do it through broad is, is greater for me, more important, more impressive than a God who has to do it boom, 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 boom. So I don't think that Darwinism shows that God doesn't exist. But I do think that God, Darwin, I think Darwinism shows how science can work for humans. But also, I think I would, I would say this, that I do think that Darwinism says to the Christian or the Muslim or the Buddhist or somebody like that, I think you need to look at your religious beliefs and see if they can just continue as they have been. Or well, now we know more whether you shouldn't be trying to alter them a bit. If, as you say, we're made in the image of God and God gave us the power to think and to look at things, then God didn't expect us to do nothing with them when he came up. And so if it turns out that I'm going to have to change my religious beliefs a bit to accommodate this, I don't think you're giving up on God. Anything but, I think you're doing exactly what God wants you to do. God, I mean, when you were a little boy, your parents didn't expect you, let us say, to be able to drive a motor car, drive an automobile. Your parents didn't expect you to be able to work a computer. Your parents didn't expect you to whatever it might be. But of course, as you grew up and you started to develop more and more knowledge, then your parents did expect you and your teachers did expect you to be able to. I mean, if you'd said it at 15, oh, I'm just too young to work with computers. Your teachers would have looked at you as though you're peculiar because, in fact, these days, 15-year-olds know more about computers than anybody else on this earth. So in other words, what I'm saying is growing up doesn't mean just doing nothing. It gets, means getting better and better at what you do. And when you were a little child, you believed in Father Christmas because, you know, it all made sense. But there comes a point 
if you believe if you believe in Father Christmas when you're five, that's fine. If you believe in Father Christmas when you're 25, that's not fine. There comes a point where you have to say, you know, I put away childish things. I mean, that's what St. Paul says. When I was a child, I thought this way, but now I'm a grown up. I have put away childish things. And I think that that's, you know, dealing with things like evolution and dealing with religion generally. It doesn't mean as you grow up, as you learn more science, as you learn more about these things, as for instance, as for instance, we learn more about men and women and how women can function. Now, the Bible says women don't speak in church. Do what your what your husbands tell you to do. Well, 2000 years ago, maybe that made good sense. Maybe it did. But now it's not good sense. But should we keep doing as some American evangelicals say, ah, oh, yes, but the Bible says that the, the man must be the dominant one in the family because that's what the Bible says. Or do you say, well, science, my own reasoning has shown me that women are a lot more equal to men than I thought they were. So obviously what God wants me to do is modify my religion so I can deal with it. Homosexuality. The Bible is against homosexual, homosexuality. But now we know that people don't choose to be gay or straight. It's something they're born with. And we, what we also know is that, by and large, if your teacher is homosexual, it's not going to turn you into one. In other words, if it turns out your favorite teacher is gay. It doesn't mean to say that you're going to be gay because, you know, you're going to say, well, I, I like you very much, Mr. Jones, but, you know, I'm interested in girls, sorry. And now, I mean, and so what you say is, well, the Bible says it's bad, but now we start to say, well, maybe it's just different, just different, and we should respect the differences. It doesn't mean to say that all the teachers should seduce young boys, but that's wrong anyway. You shouldn't do seduce young girls, so that's a different matter. But we're saying we now see that, may, that homosexuals and gay people and, and straight people are not that different. So the Bible then, uh, my religion, has to be developed and informed to take account of this. And that's not being against God. That's being very much with God and doing what God wants us to do. So that's the, the way I would approach these things. All right. And uh, we are approaching the end of uh, the discussion. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. So the last thing that I would like to ask is that the very first article that I read from you many years ago, uh, from it, it was... It can't about... be that far long ago because you're not that old. How old are you? Yes, it was in 2012 or so, eight years ago. Oh, okay. 33. Uh, okay. I, 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 no, it was in 2012 and I am now 30. 30. Okay. So you're uh -huh. not that old. No, okay. not that old. So, and... Uh, what I got from it, that we cannot say for sure that we have definitely progressed. And when I read your book also, uh, I got the sense that maybe I can make that judgment that we are superior, we have progressed, but... Uh, I think that, I, I would agree with you, but I think it's our judgment. It is It's our. not God's judgment and it's not nature's judgment. Mm -hmm. Of course, in respects, technologically, we're much superior to what we were 100 years ago. To what, I mean, think of email. Think of email. <clears throat> we can communicate now 10 times, 100 times more efficiently than we could 30 years ago. It's amazing how it's changed. So, yes, there's been progress. Like, but is it absolute progress? Is it something, you know, which is written? No, of course it isn't. I mean, apart from anything else, we spend a hell of a lot more time sending letters than we ever did. And sometimes I think it, it would be just as well if we didn't spread the information that much. I mean, look at, look at American politics and how the right wing politicians and on, their, on the television and the, things like that are able to spread all sorts of lies, for instance, about this last election being fraudulent. Well, that's, they can do that because the way of communication is so much better. So I'm not sure that it's always progress. So yes, I, I would judge progress, but as I say, it's my judgment. It's not the nature's judgment and it's not God's judgment. 
And in some respect, it can be a wrong question to ask. Look at crocodiles. They can even eat warthogs. Yeah. So are they more, are they superior? I don't well, know. Well, obviously, in some respects, crocodiles are because they're going to be able to survive when we can't. But yeah. it, you know, and because they're reptiles, they can probably survive for a lot longer without food than we can. Of course they can. But it doesn't mean, to, so in that respect, they are superior. But it doesn't mean to say in every respect they're superior. It doesn't mean to say that, you know, I'd rather have sex with a crocodile than with a human being. I mean, I'm not gay. I don't want to have sex with you. But you know what I mean. Yeah. So <laughs> anyhow, so there. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, right. So uh, thank you so much for your time once again. And uh, regarding what you mentioned uh, during the podcast, uh, I really appreciate the fact that you didn't even check um, my credentials. You didn't check my rate, podcast rating. And I was even worried that you might not even answer my email. But you very generously did. And yeah. we have spent so much time discussing. And well, it's I, so I'll fun. tell you what, Mohammed or Mo, you get Mo. back in touch with me at the beginning of January, if you want to do more. I, I think mm -hmm. now I've had enough for one year. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I am old. I'd like to sort of, you know, go quietly into, into Christmas and everything like that. But if you want to get back in touch early in January and would like to do one or two or three more, I'm very happy to do that. Okay. I think one more would be fine about atheism and Darwinism. All right. Well, let's do that then you know, in the middle of January or something middle like that. January. Okay. okay. And that's Very when, well. you know, we'll both be fresh and ready. And then you can tell me who you are. Okay. Uh, sure. So happy holidays in advance. And, and you too. Happy New Year. <laughs> yeah. Nice it's been you. very nice talking to you, young man. The same. I, you know, no, I mean, I'm a teacher. Mm -hmm. So that's not only my job, but as I said, that's how I get my happiness. I mean, it, doing something like this, obviously, I've enjoyed for the last hour talking. So, yeah, I'm a much happier person because I do this sort of thing. I mean, it doesn't mean to say I can do it all the time. But anyhow, all right, I'll see you. OK, see you. Thank bye you. Bye bye. Bye.